Method is the standard. It is the best level of accuracy. The performance standard is using that method to check another instrument. So we're going to talk about performance standards 11 here. And then after the break, we're going to, you'll hear PS 12A and 12B for Mercury. So they are also performance standards that you use method 30B for Mercury to test their accuracy. So I, I hope that makes sense. A performance standard is meaningless without checking it against a reference method. Method 5, method 29, method 30B, whatever. Okay. So these are some of the commonly used technologies for PM SEMs that are out there. So you have light scatter, sending a beam across the stack and seeing how much interruption there is. So the beam goes across and comes back. Depending how much the light goes like this, bouncing off the dust, the instrument can see how much dust is in the, in the gas. Okay? So that's, that's the probe. So uh, beta attenuation is a more of a weighing, gravimetric kind of method where a filter will change and get weight of gas or, or the amount of dust that puts, puts on a filter. Probe electrification is where you have a probe and it's, there's electricity. It's electrified probe in the stack. As the particles or the dust go past the probe, they also have an electronic charge in the particle. That electronic charge from the particle is, is interrupts the electronic charge of the probe, and it can measure how much dust is coming past. So like this. Comes past the probe, and the the two electronic signals interact, and then we can measure how much dust is coming out. Light extinction is not used very much. Um, basically, it's sort of like light scatter, but a little bit different in the technology. Um, it's more to do with not how the light uh, uh, bounces, but how much light comes through the, 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 the smoke almost, through the gas, how much is, comes back. <coughs> um, and then optical ciliation is, again, fairly rare. You probably won't see this. So light scatter and probably probe electrification are the two most common because they're more cost-effective and more accurate in the instrument, okay? But any of these, if you just take it from the factory and put it on the stack, what value is it giving you? It's giving you a number, but what does that number mean? Okay? The electrified probe is going to give you a voltage, right, an amperage signal that comes out, okay? But what does that mean? If it's high voltage, low voltage, middle, how much dust does that mean is in the stack? We, we have no idea. Does this much equal, f you know, three milligrams per cubic meter? Or does this much equal 10 or this one 20? What, what is that number? So we need to get the value of the output of the PM SEMS and match it to a method 5 
filter performed at the same time so we can say we got this much PM on the method 5 filter, it equals this much dust on the output signal from our PM sounds. Okay? So we're matching those two together. And without that, our PM SEMS has no value. This must be performed. Okay? So this is the official definition of PS11 from the EPA. And it states it is used to establish the initial installation and performance procedures that are required for evaluating the acceptability of a PM SEMS. It is not to evaluate the ongoing performance of that instrument. So what we're going to talk about today is establishing the baseline when the instrument is first installed, how we create our correlation. After that, once a year, there is different procedures that take place to check the PM SAMs to make sure nothing's changed. It's still accurate, okay? And obviously, the initial installation is a bigger process than the yearly check. The yearly check is much shorter and much simpler. Okay. So, raw data collected by the PM sends, as we we're saying, is meaningless unless we correlate it to something that has a known value. And a method 5 filter has a known value. We can weigh it before. We can collect our sample, weigh it after. We know how much dust we have. We physically have it on the filter. And we can compare that to how much gas we've sampled. So now we know exactly how much dust is in that stack. Okay? It's a known value. It's a reference method. Whereas the electronic signal coming from the PM SEMS has no, no meaning just by itself, okay? So it is isokinetic sampling, method five, that is going to offer us this correlation value, okay? So as I said, isokinetic sampling is considered a reference method. It is the standard against everything is compared, okay? So it's going to allow us to test other methods against it for accuracy and correlation. So, as I said, isokinetic is the primary standard and allows then for PM SEMS data to be collected on a real time basis. And then the numbers can be analyzed for things like emission limit compliance, okay? Is the factory performing within the regulation for emissions? Emissions inventories, okay? As the general population here in Bangkok and in Thailand I keep asking questions about PM 2.5, the government has to work out where is it coming from, okay? 10% are from vehicles and 10% is from this particular industry and 50% from here and here and here, whatever the combination may be. But it helps the government and regulatory agencies establish the big sources of pollution. Then they can start changing policies and doing things to improve the PM level, okay? So the obvious example for PM coming from vehicle emissions is okay, banned cars or 
or shut down streets in particular areas, or electronic vehicles, there's different things. And the government will do the same for industry emissions based on the information that the PM SEMS here can provide, okay? The last one I missed there was process monitoring too, okay? You've got a PM SEMS going like this, do, 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 and then one day it speaks like this, we got a problem, okay? Maybe the process has changed. Maybe we have a bag broken in the bag house. The ESP is not working correctly. Maybe we, we got raw material for our boiler from a different source. It's coal from, I don't know, Colombia instead of Indonesia. And now we see a, a, a change in our emission rate. But with this instrument reporting accurately, at least we can start making some decisions, okay, about what may have changed. So we were talking about this earlier uh, at the break. Perform a minimum of 15 gravimetric samples, okay, via... US EPA's method 5, 5I, five or 17, okay? Well, the PM SAMS is running at the same time, okay? So what you're going to do, you're going to have your stats, okay? Your PM SAM is monitoring right here. You need to get as close without disturbing the So the challenge, one of the challenges here is, and you guys told me already, most of the time for uh, method five, you only get one port. Is that one port now filled with the PM SEMS instrument? So where do we sample? So it might actually take some engineering and request to your customer that, if we want to install PM SAMs and we want to do the sampling correctly, I need you to install extra ports in the stack so I can access it, okay? And this is a challenge. This is a challenge in the US too. Very rarely do you have a, a port here and one meter down, another port or four ports so you can do your method five perfectly. Life's not that easy. It's always going to be a challenge, okay? So keep that in mind. A site survey, if you don't know the site, could be very important to perform before you even go out there. Let's see if we can even do this testing first, or do we need to make some changes, okay? And then another thing we discussed is within those 15 runs, you should be testing three different types of PM loads or levels. So you should be testing 100% to 50% max 
of the PM SAMS unit, okay? And that's going to change depending on technology and manufacturer. But if the instrument says it can read 25 micrograms per cubic meter, okay, we need to be testing between 25 and 12 and a half to really test that instrument and see what it's, what it's doing. Then we need to do another run of 75 to 25% of the capability of the instrument. And then finally, we do our low between 50 and 0%. So there's some terminology here you may or may not know, but what we're looking for is the span of the instrument, okay? So for a, for a gas sampling SEMS, you would take pure nitrogen or maybe ambient air to test your zero level, okay? Then if it's a, a SOX analyzer, you would buy gas from a gas company with a known SOX PPM value and test the high level of that instrument. That's called the span, zero to its highest possible rating. We're doing the same thing here, okay? But it's not as easy as just, you can't buy a bottle of PM. I don't know, maybe we can invent it. We'll make a lot of money. But it's impossible to buy PM, so you need to get it from the source. So, how do you do that? How do you do that? Okay. Hopefully, your facility... These two values should hopefully be pretty easy. I'm hoping that the facility, maybe with an ESP or a bag house or whatever abatement technology they have, should be running below 50% of whatever instrument that they're going to buy. The next level, you could probably get pretty close. But how do you run to 100% of that instrument? I mean, that's pure just dirt coming out of the stack, right? How do you do that? So there's a couple of ways we can do this. We can either bypass the ESP or the bag house, okay, and just let the raw emissions come out. But in some situations, too, we might have to introduce... PM into the source. So maybe the facility has a collection of fly ash, okay, that we can then push into the stack to increase the emission to get to a higher level where we need to see, okay? So again, it sounds funny that to, to make an instrument work that needs to look after the environment, we have to pollute the environment even more because we need to get our emission level up to check the instrument. But it's only this one time, okay? So this is a challenge. So it's, it's very intense working with the facility, getting some raw input, even convincing them that they need to turn off their bag house or their ESP. They're going to tell you you're crazy, you know? The, the government's going to kill me for doing this. Well, it, according to PS11, it has to be done, but just that short period of time, okay? So what are we doing with this correlation study? What does it actually mean? So we're looking for matching values or, or giving the electronic signal from a SEMS a value. We're assigning it a value. And it's going to be different in every location. Okay? It's never the same. That's why these instruments cannot be factory calibrated. It's impossible. So, you're going to take your method 5 sample, okay? And you're going to plot it along the graph and hopefully again as we talked about method 5, 
see how each run, each group of runs in the 15 runs, all bunch together. Okay. That means we've probably got a pretty good test. It's accurate. If these were all over the place, which one is correct? We don't know. Okay. Some are high, some are low, some are in the middle. How can you tell your customer what your emission level is if they're all over the place? So you want to look for a good bunching, a good correlation between the two. Then you're going to plot the electronic values as well from your SEMS instrument on the same graph. And where they fall together is going to tell you what the equivalent emission rate is for that value. And I've got another slide to show you that. Okay. So So some of the challenges, just like method five in performing this, is where the PM SEMS should be located. Okay. If you have a stack with this and the flows coming up like this and bouncing, 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 and it bounces off this wall here, and you put the PM SEMS right here, it's going to report some pretty low emissions because all that PM is coming back and forth up the stack. Or maybe it's cyclonic, okay? So it's going around and around, and you install it. Maybe you install it directly into the cyclonic flow. Now it's going to be super high, okay? So now you're really not giving an accurate value of what is actually in the stack. So you've got to do a flow rata, like a method two, in the location that you're thinking to see if it's suitable to install the PM SEMS there. Okay? So if you do a flow traverse and you've got huge flow on this side and very low on this side, where would you put your SEMS? I have no idea. You want as universal flow as possible, okay? Which again is out of our control. It's, that's not something that we can change. So if you do a flow traverse and you see cyconic flow or you see the flow bouncing back, you need to report that to your customer and say, we need to change this. Maybe they need to put a dampener in or change the pipe work, something to get the flow more linear. Okay. So you can see there's a lot of challenges starting to build up with the PM SEMS. Okay. It's not as simple as put in the stack, turn it on, yay, I'm done. No. Okay. A lot of testing, a lot of research, maybe some expense on, on fitting out the ports and these kinds of things. So it's quite a lengthy, long, and possibly expensive process. But the benefit is you get real-time PM numbers, and that's huge. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. Not only for emissions, but for process monitoring, okay? The guys in the boiler room or in the facility can watch those numbers in real time and look for any changes that might point that they have a problem in the, in the factory. Okay? So, so that's the first thing we need to check is our flow. Here we talked about our PM levels. How do you get them? Okay? So you can have the facility use different flow or production rates or fuel, okay? So I talked earlier about this with the coal example. We had a customer and they changed 
their coal coming from Indonesia, I believe it was, they changed to coal coming from Colombia. And they saw a big change in their PM level and the mercury level. Okay. So if this kind of raw material input is known, you can ask the facility, okay, today can you run this and tomorrow can you do this? Maybe it's a combined cycle and they can run on wood or pellet, wood pellets one day and then natural gas the next time you come back for a cleaner burn, okay? Maybe this is an option. Maybe it's not. But you could ask the question. As we said before, detune the primary PM control, okay? Turn off the bag house. Or maybe you correlate this with bag house maintenance, okay? Customer might say, next month we're going to be changing the bags in our bag house. Perfect. That's a good time for me to come and do my PS11 test while the bag house is not operational. Okay? Can tell you tell them to keep on running, we'll come in for that day or those two days and we'll do our high level testing. Okay? Or if they have a simple bypass around that installation, get them to use that. Okay? Injecting material into the ductwork, again, adding fly ash or something of a known value into the, into the ductwork to, to increase your PM levels, okay? Here's a little trick. Pull the probe from the stack and use ambient air, gas, ambient air as your zero. I mean, that's probably the simplest way to get to the bottom, right? To get to your zero. It's close enough. May not be pure, but it's it's going to be pretty close to zero. So you could do a little test, method five test, with ambient air, and see what it says. Okay, for your correlation. So again, all these things need to be considered, and you need to work on them, and you need to have a plan before you even go to site, because it's a long process. Most times in the US, companies are spending about one month, 30 days, at the facility doing this PM study, okay? They're running tests and then they might have a down day to do laboratory work, then they're back again and they're doing, and it's intensive work. It's good, good job security. You'd be back there every day working but you want to make sure you can get what you need to get done when you're there. You don't want to go and then come back and then go again and all these different things, okay? So there's a lot more coordination than just a basic method five test. So once the instrument's up and running, you did your correlation, you plotted it on a graph, Great, we know how much this signal from the instrument means this much PM per cubic meter. Great, we're running along, we're reporting numbers, it's good. What do we need to do to keep that instrument running? Okay. So this is referred to as procedure two under PS11. Okay. So this is what will require you to come back and check the instrument over and over again. Daily drift checks, okay? So the instrument should be looking at drift. Is it reporting at the same level of dust? Is it saying this value today and a higher or lower value tomorrow for the same amount of dust, okay? We're going to check that just like we would for a gas SEMS unit, okay? We're gonna challenge it every day with a bottle of 
gas to check and make sure it's reading correctly. So then we've got quarterly absolute correlation report and our sample volume audit. So this is kind of, these are just terms that the EPA has come up with in terms of what we need to do. And then annually, a relative response audit done once a year. So in theory, to keep this instrument running, we do a big installation test of maybe 15 or 30 days it's going to take us to perform all this testing. Then we're going to do daily checks, quarterly checks, and annual checks. Okay? It's good. Sounds like a lot of work, but that's good, right? And then we're going to do the response correlation audit, which is like the big one we did the first time we installed the unit. We're going to do that one every three years. Okay, basically a whole new reinstallation of the unit every three years to make sure it's working. So you can see how burdensome this is how much effort and work and constant keeping it up is. But we want to do that to make sure the instrument's accurate. Because again, the information that we're going to take from this instrument, we're going to use a lot okay, in reporting, government decisions, these kinds of things. Process monitoring, okay? Tuning our boiler. Maybe we can use a little bit less input, fuel input, to lower the emissions, but we still get the same result in our process, manufacturing process. So we can make improvements and efficiencies there. Factors for achieving a good gravimetric correlation. You guys all are experts on method five. You should know all of these things, right? Let's take a look at them. Isokinetics. Again, we talked about this this morning, but being as close to 100% isokinetic as possible allows us to get a good method five run, and with good data, we can compare that to the PM SAMs and feel good that that number is as close as we can get. If the isokinetics are not accurate, the correlation will not be accurate. And the number coming out of the PM SAMs, again, would, would be meaningless. Okay? Again, execution of method five as it says in the method. Do all the right things. Do your flow traverse your pre-leak check, do the weighing of your filter, secure it up in the laboratory before you leave to go out into the field. Make sure the temperature on the filter is running great through the whole test, these kinds of things. Repeatable testing. The reason why method 5 and 30B and 29 and 23 are reference methods is if you perform them the same way every time, they will give you the same accurate result. Okay? They are repeatable. There's no variations within the method, if performed correctly, that can affect your result. So if you do a method five and you come back the next day and do exactly the same process, then you know that the numbers that you're getting for your method five are, are good numbers, okay? They're accurate, they're repeatable. So if there's two stack testing teams on the stack at the same time, both performing a method five in the same way, the results should be exactly the same. 
That's what repeatability means. That's why it's a reference method, because anybody can follow along and do it the same way and get the same results. That's as important. Sustainable conditions. You want to make sure that, and as silly as it sounds, you're not running a bypass past the bag house and at lunchtime some engineer at the factory decides to go ahead and plug in the bag house. And you thinking all right, I'm at my 50 to 100%, not knowing that now the bag house is working again and you're really testing at 0 to 25%, now you're going to have all these numbers that, that don't have a meaning on one side, okay? Maybe the first two runs that you do are no bag house and the third one you get with a bag house, you're not going to figure that out till you go back and start looking at your, your data, you're going to look, okay, yep, that's 50 milligrams per meter cube, and the next one was 52, and this one's down to three. What happened? Okay, so you have to go back and figure out what happened and repeat that over and over again. And as basic as it sounds, it happens. You know, there's 500, 1,000 people working at some of these facilities. Not everybody knows that you guys are up on the stack performing a test. He thinks he's doing the right thing. He's done with his job. He changed the bag. Okay, my procedure tells me to get the bag house running again. Little does he know, you guys are up there expecting that not to be turned on. So again, that's co coordination with your customer and the management team and making sure that Stable conditions at whatever level remain as stable as possible. Now, if they change 5 to 25%, that's okay. Because each of those ranges, let me go back here. Each of those ranges have a plus or minus 50%, okay? So as long as we stay within that range, it's okay. If our high level goes from 55% to 90% on the next run, it's okay. Because we're taking the data from the PMSEMs at the same time. So we'll still be able to plot those values together. But if we go outside and we're running at 80% and then our engineer puts the bag house online and it drops to 30%, now, we don't have any more high values to use for our correlation. So again, it, it seems very simple, but due to the long nature of this process and the, the sensibility of how much data we need to collect, we need to make sure that everybody's on board and operating the right way. Lastly, one thing we can do, which is kind of unique, is paired sampling. We can sample two method fives at the same time to get a better correlation. Okay, how do we do that? I'll show you a picture here in a minute. But here's, again, a correlation curve where we've plotted our... Let me see if I can read those colors for you. I can't see it on the screen. So the first one here is our is our initial test in the it's hard to see, but in the purple circles here is our PM, and then the others are different types of instruments that they were testing, different types of technologies. But what they were looking for is, again, a correlation to see what, what does this value mean here? 
how much does this mean, okay? So when the instrument puts out this signal, it means we have this much PM, okay? And we're going to correlate that across all of those values to get a number that makes sense to us, okay? So... So here's our example of paired sampling that we can do, okay? So what we can do is actually have a probe, and I'll do my best to show you guys over here. That has two nozzles on the front. So it's actually going to be kind of a design that has two of these probes here, and it goes into a, a very small, slightly larger box with two entries in here. And the way we've designed it, we can actually fit two filters within that box as well, okay? So basically, at the same time, we're running two method fives simultaneously. We're taking two isokinetic samples almost at the same point, close enough, okay? with one probe, two filters, and then you will need two, two complete back half systems as well. It's going to be two sets of impinges and, and, and two consoles because you need to run them theoretically as independent systems. You're just utilizing one probe connected together for access to the port. Okay, but what that's going to do is theoretically cut down a lot of the time that you need to sample or you do the same 15 runs but now you've got double the data. So if you're plotting it on the graph, you've got extra reassurance that this is accurate. Okay. So you're going to have twice as many isokinetic tests compared to half the amount of SEMs. And if they're all bunched together in a nice little tight, uniform way, you could be really, really confident that those isokinetic runs were, were really accurate okay, and run together. Uh, this is done often in the US. Um, but again, it's, it's quite, a, quite a big process. One probe, one hotbox, two sets of impinges, two sets of uh, control boxes, maybe an extra two or three guys or girls up on the stack. I mean, labor, things like that. But again, you'd be offering the absolute best service to your customer that you could provide. Okay. And then you would know if you had a test, you had two filters running the same test and one's high, one's low, what happened? Where did we go wrong? Right? Again, because method five is a reference method, it should be repeatable, especially if you're doing them at the same time. So did you get a leak during your test on one side? And you're getting ambient air getting sucked into your filter, which is biasing your numbers low. Um, or other things that can happen. Did you get a blockage, a blockage in your nozzle? Or, and you'll soon see that if you've got the consoles close to each other that one vacuum keeps getting higher and higher and the other one's operating normal. What's wrong on this side? What's going on? What's changed? Okay, so again, it's just an extra security to cut down on time and, and maybe provide more accuracy for the instrument when you're doing this type of testing. So again, it's a basic method five. Nothing changes there. You do your flow traverse, you hit all the points, you do your gravimetric raying, everything is exactly the same. Now I'm not sure if you do met, uh, 5i or, or method 17 here in Thailand. They're also acceptable. Do you guys know method 17? S method 17 is where the filter is here in the front, okay? 
So you have a, I kind of looks like, you use a thimble filter, so a long, thin filter, like a cone rather than a flat filter, okay? And it goes in a housing here at the front. Very rarely anymore does anyone in the USA do method 17. And the reason is there are some PM that are affected by temperature, okay? So when you have the filter at the end of the probe in the stack, you can't, you can't manage that temperature. It's going to be the temperature of the stack, regardless of what it is. And maybe it's 140 degrees C on this side, and it drops to 110 on the other side of the stack. We don't know. Whereas a method 5, we can control that temperature of that, that filter. We can keep it at 121 plus or minus 14 at all times. And now we know that, again, repeatability, okay? With a method 17, we come back next month and do a test. Maybe the temperatures have changed. So are we really comparing two scientific experiments with the same conditions? Probably not. So majority of the time... I would say 99.9% .9 of the time in the U.S. For total particulate, it's method 5, not 17. Again, that changes in countries. Um, India is probably the opposite way around. Mostly method 17 and less method 5. Because method 5 is more, it's more difficult. It's more equipment. If you've got the filter at the front of the probe, now we don't need a hot box. So we just took away that big piece of equipment. We can come out of the back of the probe on a line straight to our glassware, straight to our impingers. It's lighter, it's, it's more simple, but not as accurate. So that's the reasons why. So as we said, common mistakes when doing this correlation study. Not keeping your isokinetics. Again, that's key. Keeping your isokinetics, get a good method five so we can do our correlation study with our PM sims. Variations on the method. Repeatability. Do the same thing every time for those 15 runs. Make sure the team is on the same page. We're going to do everything the same every time. We're going to use the same filters brand. We're going to weigh them the same. We're going to use the same equipment. Whatever it is, repeatability, okay? It's most important. Improper data recording happens all the time. You write down a two and the guy who at the office thinks it's a five. Okay, he misreads your handwriting. And now we've got a problem with our report because the numbers are getting skewed. Or a seven is a one or whatever it is, okay? Whereas the 502 is going to eliminate that, okay? Again, the 502 we've got here in the back is going to capture all of that data for us. So this is going to remove the possibility of human error, at least from data collection, okay? I can't do anything if you don't move the probe on time or something like that. We still have to perform the test operationally as best we can. But in terms of capturing the data, the 502 is going to remove a lot of that uncertainty, okay? And it happens. I mean, guys get distracted, you know. You're on a stack and, I don't know, birds fly by and, wow, look at that, something. And then you turn around and you miss moving the probe or whatever it is. 
little things, right? Um, at least with the 502, it's going to flash and tell you, hey, you ready? You ready? Let's move the probe. It's going to capture the temperatures. It's going to get all that information for you, make your life a lot easier on the stack. So now you can focus on the equipment and on the process itself. Okay. Recovery issues. We talked about this earlier. When you're done with your test, you take out the filter. Don't take it out and flop it around like this and then, uh, where's that Petri dish? And put it in there and put it on. You laugh, I've seen it. I've seen it in places. Now we're, we're changing our results, okay? Make sure we're doing things the right process. If you're going out into the field and you're going to do three runs, have three complete sets of glassware for your filter, all prepped and ready to go, okay? You've weighed the filter, you put them in the glass, you seal the end, there's one, there's two, there's three. So when you get out to the field, you t it should actually be four, should be having a field blank, okay? One that you don't use at all, and you test it when you get back to the lab. You take it to the test, you don't use it, you bring it back, and you test it again to make sure, theoretically, it should be zero, okay? And if it's zero, then you know if you did your method five test right, every piece of dust on that filter came from the stack. If your field blank has a value, where did it come from? And is that extra dust, the magic dust that appeared, is that also on my filters now from the stack? Maybe. So it's a quality control process. Three, so you should have four complete sets of glassware for your method five. Sounds like a lot, but again, improving the quality of your test. Even in the US, most guys have three sets of impinger boxes ready to go. So they do a run, they take out the filter, they do their acetone wash down, okay? They wash the nozzle, they wash the probe liner with the acetone and, and collect the dust because that dust is included, okay, in your method five test. Because the gas has passed through, the dust might be stuck. So in a method five, you include the dust from here all the way to here. All of that dust in here needs to be included in your number. So you wash it down with acetone, you let it dry, you're good to go. Okay? You take out this filter, you separate it, you, you keep it safe. Don't let any ambient dust get in there. Put a new one in there. Change your bottles. Change your bottles. And away you go. Run number two. Then you do it again, number three. So again, doing method fives correctly, it's time consuming. It's a lot of work. It's not easy, especially in Thailand. It's like 35 degrees and... 100% humidity in the sun, it's not much fun, right? So while we're up there, let's do it the right way and get it done, especially in situations like this, you know, where we're using that value to, to calibrate an instrument, really, to make it, give it a value, make it work. That's a pretty quick overview of PS11, okay? That's the basics, but this is, you guys should have most of the knowledge already to do this. You know what method five is. You know how to perform these tests. It's just executing it the right way. And the unique challenges, okay? 
100% PM, zero PCM. How do I do that? How do I work with my customer to get them to provide me that situation so I can do my job correctly? So does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Again, I'm not that good, so someone has to have a question. <laughs> Or again, we can take a break. I'll be available for questions. We can talk. I have a question. Absolutely. Can you back to the procedure too? Presentation on, on the presentation at the page 10 for the procedure too. Tell me when to stop. Okay, okay. go this forward, one? forward, forward. Yes, more. Again, again. Another one? Again. Yeah. What are different between the quarter and the uh, annually and the uh, three year? Okay. So, and the load levels that we need to do. We don't need to do the complete span of the instrument from zero to 100. Every quarter, we do not need to do this. We can just do a regular load, what's regular operating load for that instrument on a daily basis, and we do a method five, well, we should do three method fives, complete runs, and compare that for the quarterly, quarterly audit, okay, this one here. That's an absolute correlation, because again, you're going to put those three tests on a curve and put the three values of the instrument and check that it's comparing to what you had found the previous month or whatever it is, see if anything's changed, okay? Um, relative response audit's a little bit different. It's, it's looking at us to see how quickly the instrument will read changes in the PM, okay? So it's cruising along here, and it's reading, it's reading, and then all of a sudden there's a whole bunch of dust comes along. How quickly does it respond to that change in dust, okay? And that's typically a time uh, limit. And I can't quite remember if the time is the same for every technology or different, I would have to check that. But it's how quickly the instrument can read that value. You know, if you've got an instrument reading three milligrams per cubic meter, and then you see a huge bunch of black dust come out the stack and it's still reading three, something's wrong. Okay, you're looking for that 